welcome to the webinar. We're letting everybody in and we'll get started in just a minute when everybody's had a chance to get into the room. And we'll get started. I, hi, everybody. I'm Cheryl Hart. I'm Vice President of Coalition of Refuge Friends and Advocates. I'm delighted to have you all here today um, for our monthly webinar. And I'm not going to take a lot of time because I know it's jam packed and we're fortunate to have with us this morning, Courtney Phelan, who is the uh, Director of Development for National Wildlife Refuge Association. And she's going to be talking to us about end of year fundraising. So Courtney, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks Cheryl so much. Um, let me share my screen. Oh, and I forgot to say, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll try to answer as many as possible at the end. Yes, okay. Just to confirm, can everybody see Boost your year-end fundraising? Yep. Sure can. Yes. Thank you, all right. So thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, very much appreciate it. As Cheryl mentioned, um, please feel free to put your uh, questions in the chat box throughout the presentation. Um, hopefully we will be able to answer all of them at the end. There is a lot that we're covering. So if we are not able to answer all your questions, I'll take those from the chat box, answer them, and we'll send it in all the documents and information that we send to you um, after the presentation. We'll include the slides, um, the recording, the chat box. Um, I do have some resources for everybody that they can use. And then if we need to send the chat with the questions and the answers, we'll do that as well. So with that, let's get started. So who am I? Um, so I'm Courtney Phelan, but I think a lot of people still might know me as Courtney Lewis, which is my maiden name. Um, I'm the Director of Development at the National Wildlife Refuge Association. I've actually been with the Refuge Association for about three and a half years now. Um, prior to this position, I worked at Restore America's Estuaries and Earth Day Network. Um, my background is actually in environmental studies. Um, so being an environmental organization really kind of fits with what I really, really feel strongly about and know. Um, I really focused on sustainable ecosystems, climate change, and sustainable development. Um, so I tend to get the question as to why or how I ended up in fundraising. Um, so just to give you a little background about that, um, I actually was desperate for an internship um, my summer in grad school that I had to do for school. And the only one available was a grant writer for the county I lived in in New Hampshire. I wrote my first government grant for $2,500 and it was approved. And it was the greatest feeling ever. And so ever since then, um, I've really been falling in love with fundraising. Um, it's something that I really enjoy doing. Um, and then also being with an environmental organization, it fits a lot with my background as well. So I've been fundraising for over a decade now. Um, I do have my CFRE, if people are not familiar with that, it's the Certified Fundraising Executive, um, and it's accreditation, it's an international accreditation. Um, so I decided to make it official and get the CFRE um, since I absolutely love doing what I do. So agenda, so we are covering a lot today. Um, the first is what is an end of the year fundraising campaign and why is it important? Um, I wanna thank everybody that took the time to fill out the survey. Um, we'll go through a couple of those results just quickly. Um, I have three steps to start your campaign. Next is who do we solicit? Who do we go after? Um, how to write a good appeal, some of the tools that you can use for fundraising campaigns, what is Giving Tuesday? Um, how do we thank our donors? Goals and metrics, and then questions. And then just to let everybody know, I do love memes and a lot of them inv involve cats because I'm kind of a crazy cat person. So just to keep everybody entertained while we're talking about fundraising, there will be a variety of memes throughout my presentation. So the first thing is, what is an end of the year fundraising campaign and why is that important? So um, when you hear fundraising campaign, what do you think of? What is the first thing that comes to mind? If you could respond in the chat box with your response, that would be great. 
What is the first thing you think of when you hear a fundraising campaign? I'll give you guys maybe 30 seconds. Someone asking for money, direct appeal, lots of work, yes. What is the goal? Good. Knocking on doors with an ass. That's, yeah, that could definitely be one. Grab my wallet. I feel that way too when I get those in the mail. Um, tax credits and donations or deductions for sure. Planning committee, definitely. Great. Well, thank you so much for you guys for responding. Um, so what is an end of the year fundraising campaign? A fundraising campaign is th that's planned and executed around the end of the year. So that's just a very basic definition of it. Um, but really, it's something that happens over an extended period of time, and it really highlights a specific and predetermined goal. So when I say extended period of time, it could last for a week, it could last for three weeks, it could last for five years. There's different types of fundraising campaigns that happen. Um, they also really help raise awareness for your mission um, and more specifically the programs and initiatives for which they are soliciting gifts from. So it's a good opportunity to not only ask for money, but to also be able to talk about some of the great programming work that you do, some of the accomplishments that happen throughout the year. Um, so it's a really good opportunity to also communicate with your donors outside of just saying, hey, please give us money. So why is the end of the year fundraising campaign important? So actually 30% um, of annual donations actually come in December. Um, this is across the floor for nonprofits. So 31% of nonprofits get that in December. 12% of all giving occurs in the last three days of the year. And people always laugh at me because there are a lot of procrastinators out there that will donate at 11.50 p.m. on New Year's Eve. Um, so a lot of the giving does occur those last three days. 28% um, of nonprofits raise between 26 and 50% of their annual funds from an end of the year ask, which is a lot. Um, and then 79% usually do one to three donor touches, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So results from the survey, again, thank you to everybody that participated. We have 42% that have done end of the year fundraising. So um, a majority have not. Um, and then most of you are familiar with Giving Tuesday. I was really curious to see what tools everybody used um, just so I can kind of understand where we could target this webinar. Um, most people use direct mail, email, and social media, which is great. Um, and then some of the smaller ones, board participation, videos, and blogs. We will talk a little bit about board participation and videos, but we'll definitely be focusing on direct mail, email, and social media as well. And then this one I found interesting because I wanted to know what people are most interested in learning about. And as you can see, it looks like a very nicely cut pizza where everybody's very interested in just about everything with the highest being emails and then the lowest being thank you donors. Again, we'll definitely be covering all of this. So three steps to start your campaign. Some of the tools that you can use, and this is not all of them, this is not an exhaustive list, this is just a few of them that you can use. Also, don't feel like you need to use every single one of these. Um, social media, um, website, your direct mail, which is snail mail, um, email, video, just really kind of contemplate what you're able to use um, as a tool when you're doing a campaign. So the first step that you should definitely do is to create your SMART goal. Um, so SMART goal is specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. So specific, you really want to have specific key performance indicators or a specific area of um, performance. Measurable, which is, of course, important. It should be very measurable. Um, attainable, you want it to be ambitious, but you still want to remain within the realm of possibility relevant. Um, it should definitely be connected to the overall mission and goal and um, vision for your organization, your friends group. And then time bound, you should definitely have a deadline. So just one example that I can give you, this is not one of our SMART goals, it's just an example, but the National Wildlife Refuge Association's goal is to raise $100,000 by the end of January so that we can continue to protect, promote, and enhance the National Wildlife Refuge system through strategic programs like our urban wildlife refuge program. So within that, 
you have what your goal is, what your timetable is, um, and what your specific and measurable things are. So let's start with that. Next, I would suggest building your calendar. This is just an example, so it's going to be different for everybody, but it's very important to really write out exactly what you want to do for each month. So in November, do you want to use this up as an opportunity to thank your donors, send out a newsletter? What do you want to do in November? What do you want to do in December? And what do you want to do in January? So the example I have right here, Early November, thanking your, thanking your donors. Um, November 29th, which is Giving Tuesday, send out emails, post social media, asking for donations through Giving Tuesday. Um, in December, early December, get those mail pieces out in the mail, um, December 30th and 31st. Do your email solicitation, January 5th, thank donors. So again, it's gonna be very different for each friends group. Um, but it's very important to make sure that you have your plan um, so that you can make sure you execute it. Three, determine the ask. So you want your theme and messaging, but you wanna know what are you asking for? Are you asking for donations? Are you asking people to renew their membership? Are you asking people um, to sign up as a new member? Like what are you specifically asking for and make sure you stick with that. And then what are you asking, what is it for? Is it for your programming? Is there a specific project you wanna work on? And then if you do hit your goal, what will that produce? Um, you really wanna think about that because those are gonna be questions that are going through your donor's head. So big question that I saw in the survey, um, who do we solicit? Where do we find these donors from? Oop, there we go. So I always tell everybody to start with your board. Your board is investing in your refuge friends group. They're the, one of the biggest advocates and supporters of that friends group. Um, I always encourage 100% board participation in terms of donating. Um, it should be a gift of significance to that specific donor. So I would not tell a board member that they have to give, each have to give X, Y, and Z amount. It should be their own personal amount. It could be any amount, but you want to make sure that you have 100% board participation um, when you're doing your campaign. Um, because a lot of funders, they're, they're like, well, if the board's not in, in, um, invested financially, then why should I be doing that? And then what we do here at the Refuge Association, we actually use those board donations as a matching donation for our campaign. Um, matching donations are something that it definitely encourages people to give. Um, and I can say that just within our organization. So having that and using those pledged amounts from your board um, as a matching donation is great. And then I always suggest your board is your biggest advocate. So you can put together some um, talking points or templates so that they can send it out to some of their friends and family or colleagues or anybody that they might know that might be interested in supporting. Next is your volunteers. So again, your volunteers are so dedicated to your, your refuge friends group. Um, you can ask them to spread the word that we're doing an end of the year campaign. Um, they could also like post something on social media for you. Um, you can do donate themselves. So if they want to, volunteers are actually twice as likely to donate to those than those that do not volunteer. Um, so volunteers are definitely ones that, again, are very um, involved in your friends group. And so they can definitely be helpful when it comes to your campaign. Laps donors or members. So these are another really good group of um, people that you really should kind of be digging in there and seeing who is lapsed in terms of a membership or people that haven't given for maybe over 12 months or maybe 16, 16 months. It's completely up to you um, what that amount of time will be. You really want to know who didn't do that. And so dig in, check that out. Um, do be sensitive. We all know the stock market and the economy has been a little rough. Well, I guess I shouldn't say a little rough, very rough, um, especially with inflation. There are going to be people that um, are not able or don't have the capacity to be able to give. So I would definitely be sensitive when reaching out to them. Um, some people actually might have forgotten to sign back up or donate. We reached out to a lot of our lapsed donors, and I would say maybe 50 to 60% of them um, said that they just forgot to donate. And then the other um, people, we actually gave them a survey so that they could tell us like why they're not donating anymore, because that's really helpful for us just to know in the future. Um, so there are ways that you can reach out to people. 
but to not do it in too pushy of a way. Okay, so next is your email list, your social media, everything that you have. Um, so first is, do you have an email list? There's going to be a, hopefully a decent amount of people in there that either have not donated, uh, maybe just signed up to get your newsletter, stuff like that. So definitely take advantage of that email list. Um, mailing addresses, look and see how many mailing addresses you have. Um, those are a great place to start soliciting as well. Social media is also a fabulous place. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And then do you have sign-in sheets from events? I'm assuming everybody does and they're included in either email lists or other places. Um, but if you don't, I would definitely dig into those um, and see who signed up for events and then use that as an opportunity to start reaching out to people. But before you start soliciting people, you need to make sure you communicate. So I had mentioned those touches earlier. It's very important that you talk to, well, we call it priming. It's very important to talk to your donors um, before you start asking them for money. I think everybody knows that we don't want to feel like an ATM. We want to feel like um, our donation matters and that we have an attachment to your friends group. Um, so make sure you communicate. Um, there's something that I did. And again, a lot of this is definitely based off capacity. Um, you could do a thankathon around Thanksgiving. So you can split up a list with board members. Uh, maybe it's five to 10 people, whatever amount you want to do. Um, and everybody just call whoever that person is and say, we just want to thank you for your past support, for our friends group. We really appreciate it. Like you're the best person in the entire world, whatever it is. And you're not going to ask for money. Um, so it's important when you're doing some of these communication tactics, you're not saying you're the greatest person ever. Like now give us money. You want to make them really feel appreciated. So something we did at the National Wildlife Refuge Association last year um, is we sent out a thank you video um, that we actually recorded over Zoom. Um, and then Eden, who's fabulous um, and younger than I am, so I couldn't do it myself, was able to put together a very nice video. Um, and then can you guys, can you see that? Or is it still on the presentation? Okay. So I'm gonna try and play this. Let me know if you can't hear it. This will be included in the resources and the materials afterwards if you wanna look at it. Sometimes it gets a little weird when you try to do it over Zoom, but let's try it out. Well, I don't think I can hear it. Nope, no sound. Hmm. It's always when you need something to work when it doesn't I think work. Hey, Courtney, I think you have to stop sharing your screen and then click that little check box that says to All right, um, let's try use that. audio. Yeah, sorry. Let's try that <laughs> it's out. annoying. It doesn't just do it automatically. <laughs> I was, I totally forgot to do that. So I appreciate you mentioning that. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> all right, let's try this again. For all the national wildlife refuges across the country, here's to a safer and better 2022. A new year where we at the National Wildlife Refuge Association will still be here working for refuges, thanks to you. Half of all the critters that do not have a voice, thank you for using yours and your generous support for fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats that call National Wildlife Refuges home. On behalf of the National Wildlife Refuge Association, as a regional rep in North Carolina and South Carolina, I want to tell you how much we appreciate your contributions to our conservation mission on those refuges in those two states. My work has been working in wildlife since 1979 on National Wildlife Refuges until I retired five years ago. And I wanted to continue that effort. And with your support, I've been able to do that as a regional representative for those refuges. So thank you so much. Thank you to all of you for supporting the National Wildlife Refuge Association and our advocacy efforts to protect the National Wildlife Refuge System. Your contributions are helping to protect wildlife habitat across the largest area of protected lands and waters in the world. I just wanna thank all of our special people that donate to our cause because it's in support of all of our wildlife and wild lands that are very special to all of us and especially to me because I was able to work in that field. So without your support, I really think it would be a lot harder. And uh, just wanna thank you all. Just appreciate it. Thank you. Because of you, 
We're able to protect, promote, and enhance the National Wildlife Refuge System. Thank you from all of us at the National Wildlife Refuge Association. Well, I just want to say thanks to all the donors that uh, are helping the National Wildlife Refuge Association uh, conserve and protect the refuges. And, and probably now more than ever, there are threats facing the refuge and budget challenges. And with your help, we're able to advocate and make the refuge system all it can be. I want to thank you for the continued support of the National Wildlife Refuge Association. Your, your support and your contributions have allowed us to continue the advocacy for all the refuges in the country. And we look forward to continued support and continued advocacy for in the new year. Thank you. Thank you so much for your support. It's only because of the help and support from people like you that we've come this far. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. All right, so let's go back. So can we, can you see the, okay, perfect. All right, so I know it's a lot of people don't have the capacity in order to make videos. You could even do something with your cell phone at your refuge. That could be 10 to 15 seconds, just saying thank you. We really appreciate your support um, and that kind of messaging. And then you can send it um, through the email or if you want to um, include it in anything that you're sending out, you can just make a little link that people can type in. So there are opportunities that you can use um, when creating a, a video. So how to write a good appeal. You really wanna focus on story-based solicitations. Um, so this is kind of just a rough outline. It doesn't have to be exactly this way. Um, you wanna start with your lead, which is the most exciting element of your story, um, your introduction. So why you're writing to the donor and ask um, what the pro pro uh, problem is. Um, so descri describe the state they're going to help change. Um, urgency, why it's needed right now, ask again. Story, um, demonstrate the need using the life of maybe one person as an example or um, an animal that is involved in the refuge. Use a specific um, story that can really help out connecting the donor to um, your message. Ask your vision, um, ask what your values are. Remember that um, it's closely connected to the donor's values your conclusion, um, and then your PS, which you can use as ask again. So you don't have to go do this exactly that way. Um, it is good to include multiple asks in there. I do wanna point out though, that the PS is actually very important. Most people, when they open up your solicitation, that's the first thing that they look at. Um, so that's gonna be a really important place to um, tell people that you have matching donor or matching dollars, um, that you are trying to raise X, Y, and Z for your end of the year campaign so that you can change whatever it is. Um, so make sure you really focus on that PS. So nine tips for storytelling. Tell, tell stories about real people um, or you can do animals as well. Um, use emotion, I say carefully um, because you don't wanna make it too intense. Um, so you just kind of want to tug at the heartstrings is how I usually um, describe it. Repurpose your content, kind of dig in, see what you have done in the year. What do you, what is one thing that you feel like really pops out and kind of use that as an opportunity? Um, visual storytelling, um, multimedia assets. We just showed, showed you some videos um, and a lot of people don't have the opportunity or the capacity to be able to do that. But if you do, I would definitely take advantage of it. Don't be afraid of long form, um, build stories in your marketing strategy. So just think about what stories you've been able to use throughout the year, which is what I've uh, mentioned before. Um, and then you wanna tie everything to your group story. So the friends group story, what is that? So some of the good tools for your campaign. So now that we have our goals, we have our calendar, we have our story and what our message is, now, what are you gonna do? Um, my suggestion would be to first start with building your mailing package, which is your direct mail. Um, typically what's included in this is that letter that we had talked about with all the different asks in there. And we'll talk about it a little bit in just a second. Um, usually we have that signed by either the chair, the president or executive director. You can just use an electronic signature, um, especially if you have a lot of people you'll be reaching out to. 
include a reply uh, slip so that um, they can either check an amount or write their name. Um, that way you know who it's coming from, the actual mailing envelope, and then a reply envelope that they can send in, which already has your address on it. Um, you can also use your story um, for email and social media. Um, and then I would suggest sending it out to board staff and volunteers so that they can kind of repurpose everything too. But we'll go into some of those specifics right now. So direct mail, which is that the mail that comes in snail mail that we're all probably getting a ton of right now. Um, there's a checklist. So we want to make sure, do you have a specific call to action? What do you, what is it? We want you to donate to X, Y, and Z. That's what we want you to do. Um, describe what will happen when they give. We had talked about that and mentioned that earlier. Does it ask for the right amount of money? So this is a good question. Um, when you are looking at who you're soliciting, um, you might not want to ask someone that typically gives a hundred or hundred and fifty dollars with just like with an ask for 25 or 30. Um, so if possible, it is good to be able to categorize those and send out specific asks. Um, if you're not, you can leave it open-ended. Um, check and make sure that you're really talking to the donor. Is it slightly messy? And I'll show you an example, um, which is it's very interesting, the psychology that goes that's involved in fundraising. Um, is it a reading grade level, sixth grade or lower? Um, does the PS state the call to action, which is what I had just mentioned? And does the envelope incite curiosity? Um, I say that because a lot of people will get envelopes that are just blank. Um, it doesn't really excite you to open them. So if you have a message on it that says, we need your donation by December 31st so that we can do X, Y, and Z project or something like that, or, um, matching funds, they're matching funds available, please donate before the end of December, whatever it is, you wanna kind of incite that curiosity. And then also in those letters, make sure you do include a link for online donations because a lot of people do get those letters in the mail and then they end up wanting to donate online. So just to give you an example, can you see that Eden? Yeah, okay. So this is one that we did in, our, in spring. So you asked, is it messy? So it looks kind of chaotic, but again, the psychology behind it really does stick out. So we have our red bold right here. What, what, what are we asking for? What are we going to do? Um, have some photos in there, more red. We're asking support the National Wildlife Refuge Association. We need your help. Some examples. Your support is critical. Please consider giving a gift. We are going to do specific asks. And then the PS, your donation will be matched up to 15,000 from our staff and board of directors. So again, a lot of people tend to look at who signed the document um, and what does that PS say? And so you wanna make sure that you include that. Different colors are very good because again, it kind of, people are drawn to specific things. Um, so when you have different um, bolding or colors or italics or anything like that, usually people that catches their eyes. And it's good to include photos in there too. All right, so every, there was um, a lot of people that commented about how to create a great email donation. So we're gonna get into some of the nitty gritty on this. Um, as I, the first thing you should definitely do is you wanna stay on theming, your theme and messaging. Um, so what I typically used is our direct mail piece, that the example that I just showed you. Um, we would take some of that, some of that wording, um, whether it's a story or uh, matching or examples or whatever it is, we like to kind of use that as a guide just to make sure that everything um, is consistent. We don't want to send out letters in the mail that say donate $10,000 so that we can fix a fence. And then on your email, it says, well, we need $10,000 to purchase X, Y, and Z. You want to make sure everything's consistent. Um, creating a powerful subject line, this is very important. Um, that's obviously the first thing that people see. 35% of email recipients open email based on, that should say alone, subject line alone. Um, so it's very important to have one. You wanna make sure that it's urgent. So word, use words like urgent and important and, um, and stuff like that. And then words that are bad for open rates. Um, open rates are the rate of people that actually open up your email. Um, bad ones are help, reminder, and percent off. I'm guessing percent off because people 
I obviously assume that you're gonna be selling something. So I don't think anybody would use that, but just keep that in mind that it's not good for open rates. So you wanna format, there's different formatting you should do with your email. You wanna keep it short. Um, people usually only skim through it. Um, I, I know that I do the same thing if I get an email. If, if it's long, I tend to take a little while to read it or I say, hey, I'll read it later. Um, so you wanna keep it short and concise. Um, this is something that I thought was crazy. It takes 50 milliseconds to make a judgment call, which is of course shorter than a second. Um, so you, that's a very quick amount of time for people to say, okay, I'm gonna open this or um, I'm gonna ignore it or something like that. So you wanna make sure you kind of get people sucked into it. Only use a couple, couple paragraphs, as I mentioned, you wanna keep it short. So maybe two to three sentences each. Um, use big and bold imagery. Um, and of course you wanna include your contact information in the footer, um, just so that people know who you are. And if, say you send an email and they don't wanna donate online, they wanna send a check. If you have your actual mailing address at the bottom of it, they'll know where to send that to. Again, telling a compelling story, which is something that is, is very important as I had mentioned earlier. Um, so humans are hardwired to respond to stories. Um, so as I mentioned, um, you definitely want something that'll pull up the heartstrings, um, having compelling visuals, um, tell stories that are directly showcased, um, showcase the impact of your donors' contributions. This is really important. Um, people wanna know where their money is going, especially with um, younger generations. They really wanna understand if I give you this money, what is it gonna accomplish? If it's just for general operating, I think that's fine. What they're gonna be accomplishing is helping you accomplish your mission. Um, so you can definitely still do it general operating. You don't have to do something that's programmatic or project specific. Um, and there are ways that you can still kind of use those, but still raise um, general operating dollars. Make sure your email addresses the question, how should I care? How my donation, well, why should I care? How will my donation help? What do you want me to do and how can I help? So how will it help? Again, what it'll make them do? How can I help? We can, you can donate $10, which will accomplish X, Y, and Z. Um, so that's answering those questions right there. And you do wanna focus on specific programs or initiatives if possible, but it's general operating. Um, then again, I would just fo uh, focus on the mission of your friends group. Don't forget to include the ask in your email. Um, so what, again, what is your ask? Are you asking people to donate? Are you asking people to become members? What is it? Make sure you stick with that in your emails as well. Um, recommend, recommendation is to ask three times in the email. Um, so it can be a donate button at the bottom. That would be considered an ask. Um, it could be a link within the paragraph. Um, it could be anything like that, but you do wanna make sure that you have around three times. Um, and, but you want, do wanna make your first ask in the first two paragraphs. I would definitely suggest doing it within maybe the first or second or maybe third sentence. Um, that way people are, no, that they know why I should be reading this email and what they're, what we really want them to do. And then of course, state what the impact of the ask is. So using social media, um, so social media is great for connecting with younger donors. Um, actually 72% of people use some type of social media today. It's a really great opportunity to reach a larger, larger audience. Um, there are paid advertising options with Eden is fabulous at doing it for our organization. Um, I do have a link in the document that I'll be sending to you um, with ways to get that set up if you're interested in doing like Facebook ads. Um, there are actually really cheap and you can target specific people in the area that you live that probably care about like the environment or stuff like that. So you can be very specific about who you want to see those ads. Um, and what I've seen, Eden's done a very wonderful job and it has been very successful. So if you do have the opportunity to do that, um, I would certainly take advantage of it. I personally am not very good with social media, so it's very nice um, to have Eden to help out with that kind of stuff. But maybe, yeah, maybe you have someone that's good with social media. Definitely activate your vol volunteers, um, have them share posts, 
groups or um, talk about how amazing your friends group is. Um, make sure that they get involved in that kind of realm. It's pretty easy to share posts on Facebook or whatever it is. Um, so it's not too big of a haul to be asking people to do that um, if you're really focusing on social media. And then use the apps that work best for you. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, there's a bunch of different ones out there. I'm sure there's new ones that pop up every day, but use ones that you're, you're familiar with and that your friends group really focuses on. I know Facebook is a big one, um, which is why I do have more information about doing some Facebook stuff in the document that I'll send to everybody. Great content. Um, it's a great way to reach out to different donor segments when you're reaching out to people on social media. Um, as I mentioned, Facebook, you can create fundraising pages on Facebook, and I have that information for you. Or if you don't want to create a um, account, a business account on Facebook to get donations on there, I think what you can do, Eden, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is um, to have just a post that you would do and say, go to X, Y, and Z website, and you can donate to our friends group this way. Um, so you don't have to actually do like Facebook fundraisers. You can just post posts that ask people to go to your website to donate. And I think that's perfectly fine too. Um, one thing that I'm absolutely obsessed with is something called Canva. And I don't know how many people are uh, uh, know exactly what that is. I do have information about it in the resources. Um, Canva is free. Um, it's something, it's a website um, and it helps you create social media posts, um, email headings, just a, you could do in your reports, pretty much anything on that, um, on that website. And they provide templates for you to use. It's very user-friendly. Um, again, I'm not very good at that kind of stuff, but, um, I am able to use Canva. So I feel pretty good about being able to do that. So I always tell people to use Canva. It's just canva.com. Again, I'll have it in the resource. They don't pay me or anything. I'm just telling you personally, I think it's a really, really good um, website to use to create content. All right, so I know most of you are familiar with Giving Tuesday, so we'll go through this fairly quickly. What is Giving Tuesday? It's the Tuesday after Black Friday um, and Cyber Monday. This year, it will be on Tuesday, November 29th, which is coming up unless a little bit more than a month. Um, so it's a day to reimagine a world built upon shared humanity and radical generosity. I did not come up with that. It's on the Giving Tuesday website, which is also in the, in the document resources that I'll send you. Um, it's really a time to really focus on giving. It's not just giving money. Um, it could be giving time or the power of your voice to your local community. So it's a really good opportunity to bring together the community to give in some way or another. So there are a lot of opportunities with Giving Tuesday. Again, Giving Tuesday does have a website um, and I have some information about that. It's a toolkit for nonprofits. Um, you can use Giving Tuesday as an opportunity to sign up new members, um, to solicit donations, encourage the community to visit the refuge, um, sign up new volunteers. And again, I, as I mentioned, there is a website. Um, so I'll be sending that out. It is, a lot of people are very involved in Giving Tuesday. Um, so there will be quite a few emails that go out from other organizations. Um, it's good to participate in it because I think it's important to be part of it, but there is a lot of competition for Giving Tuesday. So I personally don't feel like I would put all my eggs in the basket um, for Giving Tuesday and look a little bit more towards end of the year but I still think it's important to participate in it. Um, and it, it's also a global thing that happens. So it's, it's good to be able to do that. Thanking donors. So this is something that I feel very strongly about. The thank you letters. So thank you letters are so important. Um, you wanna have a great opening, personal salutation written from one person to another. You want to have a great the great letter so thankfulness for your gift how the gift will be used what the impact is you want to write like a human which i know sounds funny um, but in plain english and conversational um, my writing is certainly different when it comes to fundraising than it would be if i was going to write an essay on something so you want to make it conversational um, and i do have a thank you letter template that will be included in everybody's resources 
continuation on the thank you letter, sign off. So you want to have a personal signature. It doesn't have to be a handwritten signature. It can just be an electronic signature that gets printed with the letter. Um, you can, for anybody that is like maybe a high level donor or someone that you think, um, do you think that the, the CEO or the president or the chair should include a handwritten note? You can certainly do that. Um, and a contact for questions. If there's any questions about the donation or anything like that, you wanna make sure that they can contact you. Not so boring admin, you want readable font. Um, and then usually you wanna send that out within 48 hours. I know that's difficult, especially around the holidays. Um, I think 48 hours is a general frame of time, but it doesn't have to be exactly 48 hours. If it's 49 hours or 72, it'll be okay. There's different ways to thank your supporters without just your note. Um, you can do a phone call from a board member. Um, you could do a thank you video. Again, just something super short. Um, thank you emails, just sending out either emails to everybody that donated or one-on-one -on -one depending on what um, your organization or friends group would wanna do. Um, you can do it through social media posts, just saying thanks to everybody that participated in our fundraising campaign. Um, we hit our goal, you guys are great, we love you whatever you want to put there. And then handwritten thank you cards. That's something that I've always felt very strongly about. Um, typically for me, I have a threshold um, as to how much someone gives before we send out a handwritten thank you card. Otherwise, we would just be doing that 48 hours or 24 hours a day. Um, so, but it's really nice to do handwritten thank you cards. I can just say, dear donor, thank you for participating or donating towards our end of the year campaign. This is what we're going to do with it. Like, you're amazing, and then write your name. And it goes very far when it comes to handwritten thank you notes. Goals and metrics. Did you hit your goal? So how many donations did you get? How many new members did you get? How many lapsed members or donors signed back up? Did you hit your goal? Some of the metrics you can use to figure out um, if you hit your goal or just to kind of be able to look back and just determine whether or not it was a successful campaign, um, you can look at how much did the board give? Did you get 100% participation? Um, how many donations did you get? How many new members signed up? How many new mem lapsed members signed back up? What was the average donation amount? Um, how many of them did you get? You can look at how much was given in the mail, how much was donated online, how much was donated on social media. It's important to look at these because as you, um, look at other fundraising campaigns that you do in the future. Maybe you spent a lot of time sending out, doing a bunch of social media posts, but it only brought in $300. But when you did your direct mail, um, you ended up getting a significant more from the mail piece. So maybe there's something else you wanna do with that or really focus on that in the future, maybe focus a little bit less on social media. It just really helps you have these metrics um, to see how you did and kind of use that as a baseline for the future. Um, so return on investment, again, this is gonna, this is in the slide. So um, don't feel like you need to memorize this right this second. But there's two different metrics that are very um, helpful when it comes to fundraising campaigns. The first is your return on investment. And the other one is um, um, how much it costs to raise a dollar. And I'll show you that in the next slide. So your return on investment. So every dollar spent raised X amount of dollars. So say you spent $250 on printing, sending out those reply slips, those letters, um, your envelopes, your stamps, all that fun stuff. And you end up raising $10,000. Um, you take the amount raised, divide it by the printing, and it was $40. So every dollar that was spent, you raised $40. Um, that shows the effectiveness of the fundraising efforts. And that's obviously amazing. Anybody would be happy to spend a dollar to raise 40. Um, and then the other is cost to raise a dollar. So how much did it actually cost us to raise a dollar? It's actually just flipped. Um, so the 250, oops, that should be 10,000, not 1,000, um, divided by 10,000, you would get a little bit less than three cents to raise a single dollar, which is great. And it shows the efficiency of your campaign. So there was so much information and like, I, um, how, how could we do this with, the capacity that we have. We only have board members. 
Um, I don't know if we can handle like all of these different things that go on in, in a fundraising campaign. Trust me, I definitely understand how that is. So a lot of information that we just threw at you. Oh, so my suggestion is of course to prioritize, look and see where can we get this ba biggest bang for our buck. Um, do we only want to solicit donors that have given X, Y, and Z? Um, do we really only want to focus on those uh, members that are not members anymore? Um, do we only want to reach out to people that are members? Um, who do you want to reach out to? Where, where are you going to get the biggest bang for your buck in terms of that? Um, sending out a donation request in the mail or email. Those both things, both of those things do take time. Um, but at least personally for me, I've seen a lot more um, positive results in terms of donations or membership or anything like that. When we're connecting with people via mail or email, um, you can do just a very simple post on social media. You don't have to do a video or anything like that. Um, just getting people to go to your website, um, but really just look at all these different tools um, that are that can be involved in a fundraising campaign. You don't have to use all of them. Which one is the best one um, for your specific friends group? And then, as I had mentioned, thanking is very important to me. So regardless, how, however you do it, just make sure you thank your donors afterwards. Any questions? I don't know if anybody's seen the SNL with David S. Pumpkins, but it's amazing. And I would definitely suggest it. Um, so let me, there was one question before we get into ones on the chat. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Let's see. So in the survey that I had sent out, one person said, we're considering doing two solicitations for our annual, annual appeal one now and then one closer to the end of the year. We will not resend to those who have already donated. Is this a good strategy? I would say yes, I think that's perfectly fine. Um, there's people like me who get mail, tell myself I need to donate or I need to um, purchase a registration for an event or something like that. It ends up on my table and then I never look at it again. So it is perfectly fine sending reminders in the mail. Um, I would be cautious about how many you do send. Um, one example that I have, my husband donated to, um, it was the church in Buffalo, New York, and we get end of the year solicitations probably every week, if not every other week. Um, and so that really kind of ends up being a little bit of a waste of um, maybe money, obviously paper and stuff like that. I don't, I don't like the fact that I get a bunch of them. It is helpful for me as a fundraiser to be able to look at them and say, okay, this is what other people are doing. But um, I think it's perfectly acceptable to say, send one um, in November on Thanksgiving and one in December for an end of the year. Other questions? Okay, so Courtney, there's been a lot of questions in the chat, as you can imagine, as you were going through your talk. Um, so I'll just kind of run down them. I've been taking some notes on that. Um, one thing that some folks are interested in hearing is about fundraising software. Is there software recommendations that you would recommend? Good question. Um, so there are different places that you can, and I'm assuming it's like a donation page where people can donate and then go in. Um, so I think that's what, what you mean, unless it's like CRM or who is the question from? Um, from Cape May friends. Okay. Um, Beth, Beth from Cape May. I can, um, I can highlight a little bit and I'll, in, I, I'll include some of that in the references on some of the good ones to work with in terms of like donation pages or like a donation processor. Um, there are some that are free. Um, and of course they take processing fees out of that. Um, so that's, that work definitely works in terms of like emailing. Um, there's like MailChimp, and um, other ones that you can constant contact. Um, and then in terms of like doing um, like more CRM stuff, we actually use Salsa Labs. Um, it does cost a decent amount of money, but it's something that we obviously use very, very frequently. We do have a semi-large amount of people that are in our emailing list. So it just kind of helps keep everything together. Um, but I will put together some examples of some of those different software pieces Great. and then um, hopefully that can be helpful. Great. Um, early on, somebody asked if 
um, the value of face-to-face -face asks are uh, important. And, and could you comment on that? Yeah, of course. So face-to-face -face asks are, are always, should always be important. At least for me, unless the donor does not feel comfortable meeting face-to-face, -face, then you can do something like what we're doing right now with Zoom. Um, I think it depends on capacity um, and really thinking about what is the best use of your time. If you do have quite a few donors out there that like to give significant amounts of money at the end of the year, and you think it's definitely important to do an ask face-to-face, -face, I think that's that's perfectly fine. I would definitely encourage that. Um, we have a lot of donors that are not close to where we're at. So it's easier, it's more, a little bit easier um, to do solicitations um, either electronically or through snail mail. But if you do have the opportunity to be able to do face-to-face -face asks, um, I would encourage that. And, and to, if you do it that way, I would encourage continuous cultivation face-to-face -face as well throughout the rest of the year. And then um, somebody asked a question about um, the use of donation buttons and um, membership forms on websites. And I think I handled some of that with, um, at our refuge, we use um, something called Wix, mm -hmm. which is a, probably like salsa, I guess. But if you had any other additional comments about donation buttons and membership forms and things like that. Um, yeah, so that kind of fits into some of the other stuff that I was talking about with salsa. I don't know, maybe Eden has some ideas. Um, Eden, you're welcome to jump in if you want to. Otherwise, we can include it in the resources. It's up to you. Yeah, so um, this is a really good question, and there's a multitude of different options that you can use depending on your nonprofit, your refuge friends group's budget, and then also the size of your donor base that you're trying to reach out to and, and how that uh, donor database is also stored. So I know probably some friends groups, they might just have a Google sheet or an Excel sheet somewhere of all their members. Um, and for those types, it may be good just to do a basic mail merge um, where it's coming from a personal email address from the friends group. Whereas if you are getting to a point where you have thousands of email addresses, it probably is time to start looking into like an email program like MailChimp, like Courtney mentioned, Constant Contact. Um, there's one called Campaign Monitor and a few others. A lot of them are reasonably priced, I would say, and you can find one that's good for you based on the budget of your friends group. But if you are looking for something a little bit ro more robust, and one of the reasons that we do use Salsa is that it offers a multitude of different tools than just um, email marketing. It also has our advocacy tools that we use to send out action alerts. It has um, fundraising form builders like you might use for Classy or you might have on Wix or if you use Squarespace, there's donation tools on there too. And it also has um, some other different things as well. And it connects into our donor database. So if you are getting a little bit larger and you are getting more records, you might want to look into something like that where they kind of sync together. Um, there's also other options where you have the engagement side um, that syncs to something that's separate. For Salsa in particular, um, they have an engagement tool and a CRM that talk together, but you may find that you like to use Salesforce or something like that, and then sync it to your MailChimp or Constant Contact account. So there's a lot of different um, options, I would say, for friends groups. Um, but because a lot of, I know, not speaking for all refuge friends groups, but knowing that some are on the smaller side, um, I would definitely look at some of those budget options because they are definitely out there. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, we'll have some you. resources. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, thank Great. you. Appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Great. That's excellent. Um, somebody asked me what, uh, somebody asked on the chat what a long form meant. What does that mean? That is long such a good form. question. I saw that. Let me get the exact definition so I don't mess this up. It is running for a relatively long time, typically more than two minutes. That's like in face to face or broadcasting. So just something that runs for a very long period of time. Okay, that's yeah. a new concept for me that two minutes is a long time. Well, um, yeah, it doesn't okay. have to be two minutes, it's something that is very long. So typically, right. it says typically this would be between a thousand and 20,000 words. So wow. that's considered long form. And I think we'll, we'll finish up uh, some of the questions. Uh, some folks were asking about raising money for endowments. 
fundraising for endowments. Is that something you can touch on? So that would be another large webinar that I think we can do. Um, Cheryl, I would suggest at some point that we put something like that together. I know that endowments have been a really big question um, for friends groups and um, I have a little bit of experience with it, but there are other friends groups that have way more experience with it than I do. So I think that it would be a good opportunity for us to put a webinar together for that. That's great. That's a good yeah. idea. Yeah. Um, there are some other questions in there, but I think we're sort of running out of time. Cheryl, do you have any other thoughts before we talk about announcements? Um, no, the other, the only other thing is hope everybody read your newest issue of the link that came out yesterday. It was, it focused on environmental education and some of the different education programs that friends groups are doing across the country. So a great place to get some new ideas. And it'll also update you on our upcoming webinar. I see a hand up. Monica has a hand up. Okay. Yes. Thank you. How many friends groups have paid staff to run these campaigns? Um, that's a great question. I don't know exactly how many have paid staff. Um, I don't think it's a significant number. Cheryl will probably know. Um, and I, that's why I feel well, at the end of the presentation, I think it's important to focus on what you think will be um, the best use of time. Um, I'm actually on a board of directors and of course, as everybody else, I'm a volunteer. Um, so I will be doing an end of the year campaign, but it's not going to be anything in depth as every single tool that I had just shown. Um, it'll be like an email that we'll send out and then some letters that'll go out in the mail. So we'll keep it kind of small, but it's up to, it's whatever the capacity you have. Cheryl, do you know how many um, friends groups actually have paid staff? I don't know the exact number, but it is fairly small. And most of them have an executive director who isn't necessarily the development person. Um, one of the things that we try to stress is, you know, the board, the whole board is responsible for fundraising, not just the executive director, even if you happen to be fortunate enough to have one. So yeah. while paid staff come in really handy when we're doing things like this, um, it, a lot of the responsibility still falls back on the board. Yeah, been a letter that's... stuffing party. Grab a bottle of wine yep. and some pizza. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can do a lot over a bottle of wine and some pizza. <laughs> Mike Scott from Hakalau, you'd have to be going after a big sum of money to justify the cost of a fundraiser. You know, you're talking six figure salary for somebody like that, depending on what kind of arrangement you made with them. For an executive director, I would assume so. Yeah, so anyway, uh, at Hakala, we're not using it. We're going after 3.5 million. It's a lot of money. Yeah, we're just yeah, about, think... cross your fingers, by the end of the year, we should be uh, donations received, interest received on the endowment. We should hopefully cross the $1 million mark. That's great. There's still, an opportunity, there's still an opportunity to make your donation. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks for pointing that out that even even for large amounts of money like that um you can do it without paid staff yeah yeah i mean the, the members of friends of hakalau are incredibly energetic one of them is on the phone on the line right here now ken Kupchak, and look yep. at what he just did for walk for the wild you know and he's doing considering comparable energy towards the endowment fundraising uh you can do it with uh members mm -hmm. who are committed yep absolutely this is sue from sherburn um, in central minnesota and the two times that we have uh, started a capital campaign we have engaged um, a campaign console and um, for a very reasonable amount we have gotten excellent um, advice and assistance preparing documents you know flyers and forms and all of that stuff you know from experienced people who are now members too yeah. and it did not cost that much compared to um trying to do it ourselves we're an all-volunteer organization and um 
yeah, it was worth every penny and the moral support too, because we don't have a lot of resources necessarily in our corner of the world. Yeah, right. capital campaigns are a whole different beast to tackle. Yep. Uh, we yep. could certainly do probably an eight hour webinar on just capital <laughs> campaigns, but um, yeah, I, it's good that you have somebody outside of the organization. Even if you had a development person, I wouldn't suggest having that person focus on capital campaigns because it's good to get someone that is specifically is specifically a consultant on that to make sure that they can help get everything prepared because it's a very large task to take on. So I'm glad to hear that it was a good experience. Yeah. And no, we're we, not raising millions though either, but for us, um, 350,000 is a real lot. So just, yeah. uh, it all depends, Absolutely. relative. But Definitely. we have done the same thing, reached out to professionals on the East Coast and the West Coast, and they've been very generous with their advice, but we're starting to feel guilty about maybe giving some, we've given them photographs, prints, that sort of thing. But how much did you pay, if, if you don't mind me asking? For our help with our capital campaign? No, mm -hmm. you said you called on some people and paid them a modest amount? Uh, yes? No, I, I guess I don't understand. We are working with how, how much did you pay your consultant is what he's asking I oh think. okay well the first time it was like fifteen thousand, and this time it's more like twenty four thousand. dollars several okay. five or six years later um okay. but we've gotten our results uh, excuse me well, we're gonna have to break in here i gotta get mike off here because we're on another zoom starting now <laughs> okay right. well um yeah what, what, thanks thank you so much courtney for your uh great um informative and thought-provoking um, topics today. We really appreciate your time. Mm -hmm. If you guys can mark your calendars, we have a couple of new webinars coming up on November 16th. We'll be talking about the Fish and Wildlife Service budget process. On December 7th, Linda Schnee from Fish and Wildlife will be talking about reporting to the Fish and Wildlife Service as part of the Friends uh, Agreement. And on December 14th, We'll be talking about a friends campaign to improve wildlife refuges, funding and staffing. So those dates we'll be announcing and sending you emails about. And Cheryl, with that, I'll turn it back to you to say, sign us off. I just wanna thank everybody for being on today. You're going to receive a recording of the whole session. You'll receive the slide deck. You'll receive the information that uh, Courtney referred to. So look for all of those resources in your email and good luck on your fundraising. We hope everybody raises a ton of money. Thanks, everybody. See you, See you next time, y'all. Bye. Thank you.